of all, our security, Ghana's security, is intimately bound and wound up with the security of the ECOWAS community. We're not an island to ourselves. If the part of the community is burning in one part, at some stage or another, it will affect us. The issues in Mali are issues that are duplicated in virtually every single one of the 15 member states of ECOWAS. The religious differences between North and South, in some places, internal differences within Muslim state. Mali is essentially Muslim, but there are still important differences. The fact that, for instance, the involvement of Kenya in trying to resolve the problems of, 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 of Somalia has then imported some of these problems into Kenya. It's not something that therefore justifies Kenya not doing anything about it. But that's also a reality that you'd have to contend we with. We will contend with it. Con decision. We are, you are going to have to contend with that reality. We will contend with it. But it always, like in all transactions involving states, at the end of the day you weigh it up and you decide on balance which is the one that most promotes your national security, your national interest, the collective interest of the community to which you are born. So you're saying a... Nana Akufuado, as president, the will Coas, be will, will adopt the more interventionist approach in dealing with... Instead of adopting a more interventionist approach, if ECOWAS has taken a decision that it is going to enter military, thing, it is for Ghana to support ECOWAS. And the Akufuado government is not going to come up to say Ghana's turning its back on that consensus. The Ivorian situation, you, correct me if I'm wrong, sir, you accuse the current government of harboring or providing asylum for pro Babo loyalists in Ghana. I didn't accuse the government. I brought to the attention of the Ghanaian people a report conducted under the auspices of the United Nations Security Council. This is an interim report? The report, interim final, a report of the United Nations Security Council. In term only because it's being disputed by the Ghanaian government, Ghanaian authorities it say is. they are part of the story, have not been factored into the complete report. But it is a report of the United Nations Security Council, the agency charged with the maintenance of international peace and security. They came to Ghana, they found certain facts, and they made the report of them. Those facts do not tell a good story. They speak of meetings being held here, by former members of the Laurent Bagbo regime who are resident in our country, the purpose of which was to plan the destabilization of the Watara. These have been rebutted by the Ghanaian government. What, that the meetings took place? That there's no evidence of these I'm suggestions sorry. by the U, uh, yeah, interim the, UN report. You mean that the meetings did not take place? That there's no evidence that they, any they of these you, They gave you the names, the venue. That's a very dangerous matter for our country. If meetings like that can take place in Ghana and our own national security... What can you do about that? You wouldn't make it happen. You, we, our country has been a country which has a very proud reputation for taking in refugees. Would you have them arrested and deported? And the Kufuado's government is not going to be going to tolerate any refugees in Ghana using Ghanaian soil to attack a uh, a, a neighboring country. A significant moment in our country's history, the declaration of the results of the 2020 presidential election. As a commission, we had aimed at delivering the results 24 hours after the election. But as the saying goes, man proposes, but God disposes. We encountered a few challenges including unexpected rains, which halted voting in some polling stations, leading to a few delays, coupled with the usual requests for recounting of votes in some polling stations. <clears throat> we regret the anxiety caused and ask that you bear with us. We hope that in subsequent elections, we will be able to live up to our timeline. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I indicate that this is a historic election because for the first time in the history of our country, the election day went by without major incidents and occurrences. It is no wonder that the BBC described this year's election as boring, and I put that in quotes, a testament of the seamless incident-free process that we witnessed on Monday. As a commission, we thank the almighty God for his faithfulness 
and for far, how far he has brought us. We recognize without a shadow of doubt that we could not have come this far without him. And as the good book states, a horse is prepared for battle, but victory comes from God. And we remain eternally grateful and thankful to God for the victories he has wrought on our behalf, and they are numerous. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is heartwarming to stand before you today to declare the results of the 2020 general election. We have come from far. We started this year with hope and promise, poised to reform and overhaul the core and critical aspects of our work and the very system on which credible, transparent elections are hinged. And here I'm referring to our biometric voter management system. We subjected this process to a robust and rigorous procurement process. Even then, from the very onset, we faced stiff opposition from within and without. As if that was not enough, we were hit by the COVID-19 virus when we least expected it. In the face of all this, we remain resolute, determined to deliver credible, transparent, orderly, timely, and peaceful elections in Ghana. We persevered throughout the lockdown to establish strong and efficient systems and processes that would stand the test of time. With hindsight, the Commission was able to use the circumstances of COVID-19 and the lockdown to our benefit, in that we were able to use the time to reflect on our processes, systems, and structures, and to implement reforms within our institution, promoting competitive procurement processes, as well as efficient, transparent electoral processes. This strategy involved our entire staff, who worked tirelessly behind the scenes, burning the midnight oil to achieve the results we witness today. Our mantra was that whilst the country may be on lockdown, as a commission, we had to keep moving forward to achieve the numerous tasks ahead of us. And so distinguished ladies and gentlemen, here we are today. The results are evident for all to see. Indeed, the hard work, determination, and focus of all the staff, coupled with God's grace, has paid off. Today, we have succeeded in reforming our entire biometric voter management system, procuring and deploying robust equipment and devices, including our biometric verification devices, our biometric registration kits, our user-friendly software, to govern the entire biometric regi voter registration and verification system, and a brand new data center, to mention a few, all of which went through an international competitive tendering process. Today, we can all be proud of a brand new biometric voter register that reflects unique individuals who are eligible to vote. With determination and focus, we were able to pre prepare a register that recorded 17,027,641 eligible voters in just 38 days and in a rainy season. Thankfully, the just ended election did not witness issues of missing names, misplacement of polling stations, among others. Indeed, we hardly experienced any issues of missing names during the just ended election. Again, as a country, we can be proud of the fact that for the first time in the history of this country, the election was funded without reliance on monetary assistance from external sources. For the 2020 election was done through an open competitive tendering process as opposed to sole sourcing and restricted tendering, as was the case in the past. This no doubt ensured value for money in all our processes. At the right time, the Commission will share its report on its procurement processes and savings made to date. 
as a country, we can also be proud of the fact that for the first time in our history, all our processes from registration to election day were laid bare to the citizenry. Through the Let the Citizen Know initiative, we provided every citizen who cared to know relevant, timely information on all our processes. Today, citizens have access to information on the number of registrants on the voters' roll, the number of registered male and female voters, the number of youth, the number of first-time voters, and the number of persons with disabilities who are on the electoral roll. In addition, today we can be all be proud that as Ghanaians we went to the polls and cast our votes peacefully. We can be proud that the technology, the technology deployed on election day worked efficiently and effectively. Voters all over the country have testified to the pleasant and seamless experienced experiences at their respective polling stations. We must be proud that it took in many instances some three to five minutes for the average voter to be verified and to vote. We must be proud that the usual hustle and struggle at polling stations, the long queues, and the overcrowding were all absent. We must be proud that in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, we all went to the polls with our safety guaranteed as a result of the stringent safety protocols employed by the Commission. And to crown it all, we must be proud of the fact that we have been able to declare the results some 48 hours after the election day. With hard work, focus, determination, and above all, God's help, we can do all things. Yes, we can. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is important to emphasize that we have achieved our successes as a result of the collective efforts of the entire team. And here I'm referring to our commission members, our directors, our regional directors, our deputy directors, our deputy regional directors, our district electoral officers, our administrative works and mechanical staff. We have all worked round the clock to achieve our goals. To all our team members, I say Aiko, I salute you all. We certainly could not have succeeded without you, and I commend you all highly. To the dear citizens of our country, we thank you for believing in us and for walking this journey with us. Your constructive feedback has helped strengthen our processes and our work and has left us in a much better place than when we started. To our media partners, we say thank you. You have been our gateway to the citizenry and have helped bring the commission to the doorstep of citizens. We could not have achieved our mandate without you and we are grateful for your partnership over the last few months. To the civil society organizations that have believed in us and shared recommendations from well thought out research and analysis, we acknowledge and commend you highly and we say thank you. We also thank our election observers, both local and international, for their interest in ensuring that the whole electoral process was transparent, fair and credible. We commend highly the international observers who have traveled all the way to Ghana in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic to observe our elections. Your feedback so far has been constructive and we look forward to receiving your full reports. We have no doubt that your reports would help strengthen our work and our processes. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the election was conducted in 38,000 622 polling stations across the country and in 275 constituencies. I'll now turn my attention to the reason why we are here. At the end of a transparent, fair, orderly, 
and timely and peaceful presidential election, the total number of valid votes cast was 13,434,574, representing 79% of the total registered voters. Permit me to present the results in the order of appearance on the 2020 presidential ballot. At the end of the polls, Nana Dodanko Akufuado of the New Patriotic Party obtained 6,730,413 votes, being 51.595% of the total valid votes cast. John Dramani Mahama of the National Democratic Congress obtained 6,214,889 votes, being 47.366% of the total valid votes cast. Christian Kwabna Andrews of the Ghana Union Movement obtained 105,565 votes, being 0.805% of the total valid votes cast. Ivor Kobna Greenstreet of the Convention's People's Party obtained 12,215 votes, being 0.093% of the total valid votes cast. Madam Equia Donko, of the Ghana Freedom Party obtained 5,575 votes, being 0.042% of the total valid votes cast. Henry Herbert Latte of the Great Consolidated Popular Party obtained 3,574, being 0.027% of the total valid votes cast. Hassan Ayariga of the All People's Party obtained 7,140, being 0.054% of the total valid votes cast. Percival Kofi Apalu of the Liberal Party of Ghana obtained 7,690 votes, being 0.059% of the total valid votes cast. David Asibi Apesara of the People's National Convention obtained 10,887, being 0.083% of the total valid votes cast. Bridget Akosua Jigbonuku of the Progressive People's Party obtained 6,848 votes, being 0.052% of the total valid votes cast. Nana Kunedwa Jiman Rawlings of the National Democratic Party obtained 6,612 votes, being 0.050% of the total valid votes cast. Alfred Kwame Isiedu Walker, independent candidate, obtained 9,703 votes, being 0.074% of the total valid votes cast. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, currently the election results we have declared exclude that of the Techiman South constituency, which has a total voter population of 128,018. 128,018. The said election results are not ready because they are being contested. As such, collation has not been completed. It is important to note, however, that the difference between the total number of votes between the first and second candidates is 515,524 votes. As a result, if we were to add the 128,018 full results, to the results of the second candidate, it would not change the outcome of the election. Hence, our declaration of the 2020 presidential results without that of Techiman South. 
Indeed, if you were to add the entire results or pro collate all the results from the Techiman South constituency and add that to the, 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 the percentage and the votes of the second candidate, Mr. John Dramani Mahama, he would obtain 47.873% of the total votes cast. And Nana Dodankwa Akufuado would obtain 50.8% of the total votes cast. It is on that basis that we say that the outcome of the election would not change. Hence, our declaration of the 2020 presidential results without that of Techiman South. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on the basis of the foregoing election results, and by the power vested in me as the chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Ghana and the returning officer of the presidential election, it is my duty and honor to declare Nana Dankwa Akufuado as president-elect of the Republic of Ghana. May God bless our homeland, Ghana, and make our nation great and strong. Let peace reign. Mr. Speaker, the Ghanaian people give thanks to Almighty God for the blessings, favor, and grace He continues to bestow on them. Exactly a month ago, that is 7th December last year, 2016, we, the people of Ghana, in all serenity and dignity, exercised our democratic franchise freely to elect a president and parliament of our republic. We are met here today to give effect to the outcome of that exercise. In accordance with our Republican custom, I, having been declared the winner of the presidential contest on 9th December 2016 by the returning officer, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Charlotte Hossein, have taken the oath of the high office of President of the Republic in the presence of the newly sworn Vice President, His Excellency Al Haji Dr. Mohamedou Baumia, and the newly elected Speaker of Parliament, the Right Honorable Professor. Michael Aaron O'Quay, and now an oath administered by the Chief Justice, Her Ladyship Georgina Theodora Wood. Before the elected representatives of the people assembled in this seventh parliament of the Fourth Republic, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our nation is honored by the presence at this solemn ceremony of investiture of leaders and representatives of friendly countries across the globe. In particular, those of the sister nations of our regional body, the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, and of our continental body, the African Union. I salute the chairperson of the Authority of Heads of State and Government of the AU, His Excellency Idris Deby, President of the Republic of Chad. I salute the chairperson of the authority of heads of state and government 
of ECOWAS, the historic figure, Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, President of the Republic of Liberia. Our special guest of honor, His Excellency Alassane Jamani Ouattara, President of the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. His Excellency Mohamedou Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Mighty Nigeria. His Excellency Maki Saar, President of the Republic of Senegal. His Excellency Fon Nyasimbe, President of the Republic of Togo. His Excellency Professor Alpha Conde, President of the Republic of Guinea Conakry. His Excellency Patrice Talon, President of the Republic of Benin. His Excellency Ernest Bai Koroma, President of the Republic of Sierra Leone. His Excellency Ibrahim Bubakar Keita, President of the Republic of Mali. His Excellency Rochmark Christian Kabori, President of Burkina Faso. We are grateful also for the presence of His Excellency Denise Sasso Ingueso, President of the Republic of Congo. His Excellency Theodora Obiang Ingwema, President of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea. His Excellency Ali Bongo, President of the Republic of Gabon. And His Excellency Edgar Lungu, President of the Republic of Zambia. To them, and the representatives of all the other friendly nations who are here, and former presidents and leaders, I say Akwaba, our famous word of welcome. Rochmark Christian Kabori, President of Burkina Faso. We are grateful also for the presence of His Excellency, Denise Sasso Ingueso, President of the Republic of Congo. His Excellency Theodora Obiang Ibuema, President of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea. His Excellency Ali Bongo, President of the Republic of Gabon. And His Excellency Edgar Lungu, President of the Republic of Zambia. To them, and the representatives of all the other friendly nations who are here, and former presidents and leaders, I say Akwaba, our famous word of welcome. I have at the outset to thank sincerely our departing president, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, for his service to our nation. He stepped into the breach of national leadership at a delicate moment in the country's history, with the death in office for the first time of a sitting president, the late Professor John Evans Atta Mills. May his soul rest in peace. He has since steered the, state, the ship of state with conviction. His elegant, dignified acceptance of the verdict of the people on 7th December 2016, will without doubt receive the approval of history, for it has contributed significantly to the process of democratic consolidation in Ghana. I wish him and his family well. For myself, I'm in the new, unique position of being able to draw on the wisdom and experience of three former presidents of the Republic, their excellencies, Jerry John Rawlings, John Ajakum Kufour, and John Dramani Mahama. They represent the continuity of the institutions of our Republic, for which we thank God. Mr. Speaker, I am deeply humbled by the exceptional mandate and extraordinary show of confidence 
that the Caribbean people have conferred on my party, the new patriotic party, and on my modest person. I am determined to do all in my power to accomplish the tasks of the mandate and justify their confidence. I will not let you, the people of Ghana, down. We have a proud heritage. We are the heirs of John Mensah Saba, Joseph Casely Hayford, George Parr Grant, R.S. Blake, Joseph Wachi Dankwa, Emmanuel Obecha Bilamche, Edward Akufuado, William Oforiata, Kobna Kessi, Ernest Akwaje, Kwame Nkrumah, Komla Agbeli Gbedema, Kojo Bozio, S.D. Domo, Kofi Abrefa Buzia, Bafo Ose Akoto, and others, who taught us the fidelity to principles, courage, patience, resilience, and collective action do yield results. They fought with intelligence, guts, steely determination, and patriotism to liberate our land and reclaim our worth as human beings. Their love for country continues to inspire generations of us to commit our lives to the search for an enduring democratic legacy for Ghana. It is not for nothing that when our forebears established the Ghanaian nation, they chose freedom and justice as our motto. Our generation has to give meaning to this motto. On March 6, in a few weeks' time, Ghana will attain 60 years as an independent nation. I suspect that those early nationals would be disappointed if they came today and saw the level of development we have achieved in 60 years of independence. Our journey has had some highs and unfortunately, many lows. Since we accepted a consensus on how we should be governed with the onset of the Fourth Republic, we have performed more creditably. It is within this period of 24 years that Ghana has witnessed a consistent period of development. Sixty years after Mesu, we no longer have any excuses for being poor. I stand here today, humbled beyond measure, for the opportunity to leave this country at this time and take us to a higher level of development. The words of J.B. Dankwa, one of the founding fathers of the Ghanaian nation, are compelling. He said as far back as 1960 that the duty of government should be, and I quote, to liberate the energies of the people for the growth of a property-owning democracy in this land with right to life, freedom, and justice as the principles to which the government and the laws of the land should be dedicated in order specifically to enrich life property and liberty of each and every citizen." Unquote. We have an exuberant and young growing population that wants the best of what the world has to offer and will not settle for third world or developing world standards. We have an adventurous people who are in a hurry for success. I have no doubt that the talents energies, sense of enterprise, and innovation of the Ghanaian can be harnessed to make Ghana the place where dreams come true. It took us a while, but the consensus on multi-party constitutional rule has been established. And for the third time, 
We've had a peaceful transfer of power from a governing party to an, an opposition one. We have done it without any fuss, and it is now part of what we do as a people. Kofi Abrefa Busia, Prime Minister of the Progress Party Government of the Second Republic, and one of the great Ghanaians, said in these eloquent words, and I quote, we regard politics as an avenue of service to our fellow men. We hold that political power is to be exercised to make life nobler and happier. Our success or failure should be judged by the quality of the individual, by his knowledge, by his skill, by his behavior as a member of society, the standard of living he's able to enjoy, and by the degree of harmony and brotherliness in our community life as a nation." Unquote. We should move on to deepen our democracy. It is time to make sure that we have a true separation of power between the various arms of government. Our parliament, the legislative arm of government, must grow into its proper role as an effective machinery for accountability and oversight of the executive and not be its junior partner. The Ghanaian parliament, the Ghanaian member of parliament, must stand out as institutions that represent all that we hold dear and citizens can take pride in. Our judiciary must inspire confidence in the citizens so we can all see the courts as the ultimate arbiters when disputes arise as they would. A Ghanaian judge must be a reassuring presence and the epitome of fairness. We have worked with our national constitution for 24 years. And we know the areas that require change. I believe a consensus has emerged that we must decentralize more. We must devolve more power with corresponding resources to the base of our political system and to our people in the regions and communities. We must trust the collective and individual wisdom and good sense of our people. <coughs> We must restore integrity in public life. State coffers are not spoiled for the party that wins an election, but resources for the country's social and economic development. I shall protect the public press by insisting on value for money in all transactions. Public service is just that, service and not an, an avenue for making money. Money is to be made in the private sector, not the public, and measures will be put in place to ensure we must create wealth and restore happiness to our nation. We can only do this when we have an educated and skilled population that is capable of competing in the global economy. We must expand our horizons and embrace science and technology as critical tools for our development. We believe that the business of government is to govern. Ours is to set fair rules. We will provide vision and direction and shine the light down the path of our entrepreneurs and farmers. We are indeed counting on a vibrant private sector to drive growth and create jobs. <coughs> we will stimulate the creative juices of innovators. We will bring to life the adventurer in you. It is time to imagine and to dream again. Time to try that business idea again. 
We will reduce taxes to recover the momentum of our economy. The doors of Ghana are open again. The shutters are up again. There could not be a better opportunity to make in Ghana and to make it in Ghana. Ghana is open for business again. <coughs> we will build a confident Ghana which is united at peace with itself and takes pride in its diversity. We will rekindle Ghana which is united at peace with itself and takes pride in its diversity. We will rekindle the spirit that made Ghana the leading light on the African continent and make our conditions deserving of that accolade. We will work with our neighbors and friends on the continent to enhance peace, democracy, and political stability in our parts of the world. We will reassert vigorously the Pan-African vocation to which our nation has been dedicated. Integration of our region and of our continent will be a strategic objective of Ghanaian policy. It will not be easy. We have no illusions whatsoever about the enormity of the task that we face. But I know that Ghanaians at home and abroad will rise to the occasion. They always do. It will require sacrifice, but it can be done. Others have done it. So can we. Our best days still lie ahead. Though our challenges are fearsome, so are our strengths. Ghanaians have ever been a restless, questing, hopeful people. And we br must bring to our task today the vision and will of those who came before us. The Ghanaian people have summoned the change we celebrate today. They have raised their voices in an unmistakable chorus. They have cast their votes without equivocation and have forced the change. Now we must do the work the season demands. <coughs> To that work, I now turn with the, all the authority of my office. I ask the legislature and judiciary to join with me. But no president, no parliament, no government can undertake this mission all by itself. Fellow citizens, you must be at the center of the change. The change we have voted for will have to start with each of us as individuals. We can start with little changes in our own individual attitudes and practices. The change can and should start now and with us as individuals. I ask you to be citizens. Citizens, not spectators. Citizens, not subjects. Responsible citizens building your communities and our nations. Let us work until the work is done. Holy Scripture in Galatians, chapter 6, 9 says, and I quote, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I assure you, my fellow citizens, who have entrusted me with this mandate, that I will advance my convictions with civility. I will serve the public interest with courage. I will speak for greater justice as well as compassion. And I will call for responsibility. And I will live it as well. This is my solemn pledge. I see exciting times ahead. The rule of law will be the underlying tenet of our lives, and the law will be applicable to all of us, and not just some. We will have to work hard 
harder than we have ever done before. And the hard work will be done by all of us and not just some. There will be discipline in all sectors of our lives and this applies to all of us, not just some. Our public service will be accorded the dignity and respect it deserves and be made to attract the young, bright young people it needs. We acknowledge there will always be the need for a safety net for the vulnerable in our society, as in all other societies. Our nation will work when the marginalized and vulnerable are catered for and treated with respect. Our elderly people will be recognized for their roles in building Ghana and have showed of care in the dusk of their lives. We should all recognize the danger we face by the alarming degradation of our environment and work to protect our water bodies, our forests, our lands, and the oceans. We should learn and accept that we do not own the land, but hold it in trust for generations yet unborn, and therefore have a responsibility to take good care of it and all it contains. Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, or Sajifu, set at the end of 1957, the year of our independence, and I quote, we shall measure our progress by the happiness which our people take in being able to manage their own affairs. Since March 6, 1957, we all say as a matter of routine that we are Ghanaians. It is time to define what being a Ghanaian ought to mean. Being a Ghanaian must stand for something more than the holder of a birth certificate or a certain passport. Being a Ghanaian must put certain responsibilities on each of us. Calling a, yourself a Ghanaian must mean you have signed up to a certain definable code of conduct. Being a Ghanaian puts an obligation on each one of us to work at building a fair, prosperous, and happy nation. And calling yourself a Ghanaian must mean we look out for each other. There should be no higher praise than to be able to say, I am a Ghanaian. I thank the Almighty that I'm able to say with pride, I am a Ghanaian. A new dawn has arisen in Ghana, which will enable us to build a new Ghanaian civilization, which will be the beacon of Africa and the wonder of the world. I thank you all, my fellow citizens, for making me the president of this beautiful country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and may God bless our homeland, Ghana and make her great and strong, and may God bless us all, and Mother God, Africa. ...political stability with a multi-ethnic population coming together in peaceful, democratic elections. But why is Ghana so different from its neighbours in this respect? And how has the country managed to solve social and political problems the rest of Africa is dealing with, or is there still work to be done here? We will find out as Nana Kufa Ado, President of Ghana, talks to Al Jazeera. President Kufa Ado, a very warm welcome to talk to Al Jazeera. It's nice of you to have me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Africa, going through a lot of developments at the moment, many other countries, seismic changes for some. If you look at what's happening in Zimbabwe, DRC, Togo on your border, the state capture, in South Africa, so there's lots to talk about there as an African leader. But let's first talk about the domestic issues and how your country stands out against many of these countries because it's considered so successful. Why is that? Well, as you know, we were the first of the sub-Saharan African countries that had ex suffered colonialism to get free mm. uh, 60 years ago. So that sort of has conditioned 
the development of our country. And then the first three or so decades after independence were very turbulent and volatile. We went through all kinds of issues, one party state under Kwame Nkrumah, a succession of military governments. And I think that by the beginning of the 90s, especially with the, what had happened with the downfall of the Soviet system, it was a strong recognition in Ghana that really we needed to go down the path of democratic engagement. And that decision having been taken in 1992, we had the first of our seven elections that we have held. And the determination of the Ghanaian people to go through democratic principles and values um, has meant that election after election has been stronger in terms of its credibility and its transparency. And it has also meant that the willingness of the population to accept the results of the our electoral concert has heightened. But how did you get it right when so many countries are struggling with that concept? Because we had passing our, power on, because we had letting it filter down to the people. Because we had our problems early. We were the first, and so we had the problems first of what is the kind of system. And after, as I said, after the turbulence, after the volatility of the first 30 odd years after independence, the people of Ghana, because at the end of the day, it is they that really determine. Uh, the, the, the evolution and the outcome of, of, of events made up their mind that they want a democratic government, they were determined on the multi-party state, and they would insist that we, the political actors, also act within. So three times in Ghana, recent history, we've had all changes of government from opposition to government, or government to opposition, and it has been done in a context which has allowed peace to flourish in the country and also for um, principles of democratic accountability. So if you put it work. that way, I mean, do you look at a, a country like Zimbabwe where we've seen the military uh, step in and take over basically? I mean, do you think that eventually it'll rise like the Phoenix 2 once it goes through some of the processes that you did? Or is this a totally different story and the different I factors believe, at play here. I think, I think that at the end of the day it will also. It, the, 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 the determination to, to uh, engage democratic values, I believe will, will, will triumph in Zimbabwe. It's a pity that the, the current political situation has degenerated to the extent that the army is finding this itself to come directly into play. In is that ever a solution? It can never be a long-term solution, obviously. It can never be a long-term solution. Uh, but I have we, I've not got enough information about what actually took place and why the, the, this, this situation has evolved for me be able to say, uh, uh, this is my position or the position sure. of Ghana. How important is it for stakeholders then to get involved in the democratic process in a country like Ghana? I mean, you've got different tribes, you've got different ethnic groups, you've got different religions. How do you make sure that everybody feels that they are involved in the democratic process, in the education system, that they're all benefiting you know, equally? First of all, you know, the insistence. The political parties in Ghana have a national and not an ethnic coloration. has been very important. The two main parties in Ghana are well represented in all parts of the country. They, uh, they have their strongholds, they have regional or ethnic strongholds, no two ways about that. But nevertheless, the coverage, the reach of the parties is truly national. The language of our constitution is also insisting on a national response to it. You, uh, you have all kinds of principles in the constitution, directive principles that insist on the Ghanaian as against the regional or ethnic response to, to events. And, but then I, I keep coming back to the experience of our people who have gone through some very difficult times in the past, a lot of turbulence, and have now decided that they want democracy, they want democratic. And I think that once you have that bedrock, it provides the contours, the context, which then determines 
state action and the response of state action. And how stable is that bedrock? On, on your border, you've got Togo, it's got massive problems there, demonstrations, trying to overthrow the president. Obviously, you've got ties, strong ties with the country. You've got a refugee situation happening. Are you worried that that could provoke some sort of instability in the country that could you have to stir be worried. any tensions? You have to be worried. Of course, you, have to. you cannot be complacent. I mean, I remember vividly uh, 12 years ago when the father of the current president died, the first uh, president, Yadima, died, and there was a crisis in the succession. Uh, and the issues that emerged from there meant that 100,000 Togolese came across the border to settle in Ghana. Some are still there. They never went back. It is true that the people who live on the border of Togo and Ghana are essentially the same people. Uh, but is it a, a Togo problem? I mean, Ghana yes. has been accused of meddling in the past. Is it something that should be dealt with internally? It has to be dealt with by the Togolese. We, are, we will do whatever we, do, we can to assist. They're a brother and a neighbor, and they say that when your neighbor's house is on fire, the intelligent thing is to help them put it out before the fire consumes yes. you. So we are, we are and, and we're doing that. We're playing a role in trying to, 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 to see to what extent uh, uh, dialogue and discussions can take place amongst the main actors so that a solution, a peaceful solution, can be found. But they have a peculiar history. And it's that history that is playing itself out now. But I, I'm confident that the, if you like, the march of democracy in Africa is something that's going to be very difficult to reverse. Largely because... Do you think democracy represents different things to different people? And is that the way it should be perceived? I think it no, I, I, I see there's a, for me it has universal uh, appeal. It has, it has to do with freedom of expression, it has to do with freedom of association, it has to do with having a capa the capacity peacefully to change government. If you put somebody there, they are no good, four or five years later, you can go up to the ballot, put your ballot there and change them. And, and, and to have that, that, I think all people relish that power and relish that opportunity. I mean, take um, uh, South Africa, which has been a strong force for democracy on the continent ever since apartheid was, 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 was disbanded. Uh, the, even though you've had a party of with over, almost overwhelming support in the country, that party was very careful not to close the democratic space in terms know, of freedom. But, but look at it now, what's happening. I mean, you're seeing a, a system that is being, uh, you know, some it's people changing. say it's, it's, changing. it's, it's changing. It's it's been raped, it's been abused. I mean, is this well, it's also, also one of the problems of liberation parties? Is that... It's changing. It has to change. I don't think that the ANC could, and even those who lead it, could think that they would have the predominance they have in South African political life forever. It, it, that would be absurd. Uh, at some stage or another, the, 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 the mechanics and the dynamics of, 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 of development would mean new alliances would form, new arrangements, new political configurations would emerge. And, and do you think the mechanics are strong enough in South Africa? I know there's a strong judi judiciary and independent media at the state. Are those factors strong enough, do you think, to keep well, the checks so. and balances? Well, I would hope so, because you, uh, you don't hear and the language of, of those who think that another system would serve South African interests better. Mm. You hear people say, a particular, the president is no good, this is no good, this is no good. Fair enough. But I think that the attachment to the, the values that underp underpin democratic engagement, I, f I feel that those are very strong in South Africa. And I feel I, that I they're strong. Said proud of Africa, Pan-Africa, you know, a strong Africa. When you see what's happening in countries like Kenya, the, the voting process, the election, electoral process that, that seem to have uh, gone through great difficulties at the moment, South Africans and Mubi, does it worry you um, when worries, you see that it worries, coming out? It that, worries, but at the same time, for me, I think that we, we, are all, we, we all have at the end of the day also to be historians and to recognize that the evolution of democracy, even in the areas of the world where it has been consolidated in Western Europe and in America, 
I mean, went through many, many, many stages and many events, and some of them very turbulent and, 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 and ultra potentially destructive. Of the, but they were able, on the end of the day, to overcome it, and the, that, and the systems and the principles and the institutions that have been established are now so very strong that it, be, it's become, it becomes difficult to contemplate their being set aside. I mean, even today in Europe, I mean, the events that are occurring with these populist right-wing movements that are taking place, some of whom's undertones yeah. are certainly anti-democratic, but they're still taking place within the democratic space. I think because the institutions of, of European democracy are now very strongly entrenched within the body politic of the various nation states of Europe. I believe that the problems that we're seeing on our continent, I'm not saying we have to be complacent and think that, oh, it's happened elsewhere, so we should just sit back and no, it will happen to us. Well, we need to work at it. We need all those of us who are attached to it have to be active. In Can I pick up, sorry, on something you, you said a little earlier on about freedom of expression. So I, I want to ask you about what is happening in your country and homosexuality, for example, which I believe is illegal and it's punishable. I mean, why is homosexuality still illegal in your country? Um, these, the, the social, cultural issues, if you like, um, I don't believe that in Ghana so far, a sufficiently strong coalition has emerged, which is having that impact on public opinion that will say, change it. Let's then have a new paradigm in Ghana. Is I that think, something you would get behind? I though? think I think that it is something that is bound to happen, and when that happens, what's going to provoke it? What's going to make it happen? Oh, it's, it's the activity, like 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 elsewhere in the world, like elsewhere in the world, the activities of individuals of groups. I, I grew up in England. I went to school as a young boy in England, and I grew up at the time in England when homosexuality was banned there. It was, it was illegal. And I lived the period when uh, British politicians thought it was, it was anathema even to think about uh, changing the law. And then suddenly the activities of individuals or groups, a certain awareness, a certain development, grew and grew and grew stronger and it forced a change in law. I believe that those are the same processes that will bring about changes uh, in our situation. Uh, at the moment, I don't feel, I don't see that in Ghana there is that uh, strong current of opinion that is saying this is something that we need even deal with. It's not, it doesn't, it, it, it's not so far a matter which is on the agenda let me ask you about something you've tweeted about. You say, critically, men and boys must take responsibility to say, responsibility rather, to say no more, no more child marriage. How big a problem is that big problem. In, in the country? And why do you think it's still there? Is, is it an education issue or Obviously, cultural? obviously, educational, stroke cultural. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a matter. You have also uh, economic, the, the economic difficulties that force people to behave. A certain sort of way, but these are these are matters that um, we are determined to try and do something about. We're mm. doing it's a big because it has a devastating impact on society, doesn't it? It does indeed. Mm. It, people, there's a big campaign to to raise awareness on it. Uh, there's a determination to ensure that the laws are enforced. Mm. Um, and our intelligent pricing tools and experts help maximize your income by determining the right price for your property at any time. The general awareness of the society also on the matter is growing stronger and stronger. So we're in a stronger and stronger position to deal with. Mm -hmm. We have other matters of equal concern. Child marriage is there. There's also human trafficking, right. which is very much a function of, of, of conditions of poverty, and yeah. of, of extreme poverty, unfortunately, in some parts of the country, and therefore also allow them lend themselves mm -hmm. to criminal syndicates who prey in those circumstances to organize um, um, obviously human devastating, isn't it? Really I know that your wife is very involved in fighting HIV AIDS or she's very outspoken about it. How big a problem is it in Ghana? Is, and do you think that African countries are doing enough to defeat this? I'm not sure on a matter like this I can speak on, on, on a continental right, scale. Right, because it's not really one size fits all, is it? Yes, it yeah. isn't, okay. and I, I wouldn't sure. want to. But I think that we're making a good fist of it in Ghana. 
um, the the prevalence rates are are declining. Uh, the the awareness of the issues is very strong. It's much stronger in Ghana today than it was, say, ten years ago. And all of that is part of the uh, response that has been to government's uh, determination to make it an issue for mm. people to around which people can then to get to talk about it, to talk remove about. the stigma yeah, yeah it's been important then but it's 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 something that we cannot sort of sleep on we have to continually no. be active and, and, and work at it so I see you are quite active on, on Twitter, and I see that you met Donald <laughs> Trump, <laughs> and another man. Yes. Uh, I'm happy to say your tweets are very different. <laughs> what do you think of him? Well, there's the, 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 the figure on television and what you read about. Uh, it's a, a, a volatile picture that you get of, of somebody because he seems to to change views. But then there's a person that we met. I was with a group of um, African leaders during the last uh, UN General Assembly in, in September in New York. Uh, about eight or nine of us were invited by him to lunch. And the impression that he conveyed, the, the, the sense of himself that we all got, was very different from the public image that we had. First of all, a certain humility. You know, he walked in, uh, I don't know too much about your place. Mm -hmm. and I've called you here for you to tell me a little bit so I can know a little bit more. Uh, I just have one, he made the statement, I have one or two friends who've gone there and may come to your countries and made a made lot of, lots of money. money. Yes. And congratulate you for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> congratulate you for that. But, but the attitude that he, he showed at that lunch, I think, most of the people, and there were some very wise, and I was one of the newest in, 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 in the leadership circle in Africa. I've been there, what, 10 months? But some of them who had been there for a long time, I could see were, were significantly surprised, positively so, by his manner. When it comes to Africa, do you think Donald Trump will be good for Africa? Obviously, he touts his America First policy, you seem to have negated what a lot of people thought that possibly he doesn't know much about Africa, that he's not going to be good for Africa. Where do you think that relationship will go? And could it be a competitor, a healthy competitor to China? The, 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 the America first, I mean, that resonance is not something that is, is necessarily negative as far as I'm concerned, because I think that when you are the leader of a nation, that has to be your concern. <laughs> the interests of your people and your country first. And I think that what we on the continent are also required to do at all times is to define for ourselves what are our interests, what are our goals, and what are the instruments we need to, to assemble to be able to prosecute and, 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 and realize these goals. And do you think it's a healthy balance? I mean, do you think Africa is able to retain enough of what it needs when it comes to the big players like the US and China? Maybe, because at the end of the day, even the period of liberation was undoubtedly helped by the Cold War reality of the West and the Soviet bloc. So to that extent too, I think, yes, there could be a positive aspect of it for us, this competition between the two great uh, uh, players of the world, which allows us also to chart our own independent response to what we need to do to develop our continent. You also tweeted that you believe it's time for Africa to come of age and hold its rightful place on the world stage. This Africa will be neither a victim nor a pawn. This Africa will be honest to itself and to the world. I mean, do you think it's ready for that now? And how, does Africa, how does Africa achieve that? It has to be because um, the, the, the caricature of us as either pawns or victims does, does nothing for really our self-respect. It? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it does nothing for our self-respect or self-confidence. Through Africa's own fault or because of the story that's been told about Africa? Do you think there's a there's misunderstanding? A, well, there's, to some extent there's an element of fault. If you're weak, people will take advantage of health, education. That, that's, that surely is an unacceptable situation 
for any self respect. Do you think a big though. government will will achieve, will, will correct think, the balance? I think that the balance is corrected mm. by policy, mm. it's corrected by internal mobilization, mm -hmm. it's, it's corrected by a focus that really that's an intolerable situation and we should be in a position to finance our own development. Uh, let me just ask you about your big government, 48 ministers, four ministers of state, 60 deputy ministers. I believe it's the largest government in Africa. What is the thinking behind that? Because I know that many people do look at Ghana and say, right, when it comes to transparency and uh, corruption matters, is, you are ranking very low. So how does this all fit is, together? And where do you see Ghana in 10 years from now? The, the big government, as you call it, is because we need that, that capacity. We have, you have weak, uh, weak institutional structures. You have civil service and public services whose enthusiasm for moving things in a particular direction may not be as strong as they should be. And therefore, to have a political hand on it that is saying this is where we're going and this is where we're determined to go is extremely important. Ten years from now, I'm looking at a Ghana that is so much, has much greater self-confidence, a Ghana that is now financing its own activities, has reduced considerably its dependence on aid because its economy is working, the private sector of our country is growing stronger and stronger, and the arrangements that we need to make with the outside world are increasingly arrangements that are on our terms. The Ghana that we're looking at is the Ghana that has come of age. Uh, some, 10 years time will be Ghana, 70 years from independence. We should by that time be really standing on our own feet. I have uh, a great deal of confidence that that Ghana is within reach. It's within reach because of the focus that we're trying to bring to national development. I think that if that focus succeeds um, in 10 years time, I'm not sure that I'll be around uh, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> well. to review this discussion. <laughs> but uh, I think that in that time, um, uh, 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 the image and the framework within which people look at Ghana and, look and, and see it will be radically different. President of Ghana, Kufado. Thank you.